In this final week of campaigning, the agenda looked at why education and child care weren't discussed as much as they have been in past elections and heard from former cabinet ministers on what this campaign was about. The agenda's week in review begins reflecting on the rise of some of the new parties on the right of the political spectrum. Jania, I, I wanted to get your take on, I mean, it, we've talked a lot about New Blue uh, during the course of the campaign. They've got most of the attention because the Carajalios is, uh, you know, th they do tend to attract attention. They're uh, an interesting couple. Uh, they had a seat in the last legislature, not elected to it, but, but um, Belinda Carajalios, when she was kicked out of the PC caucus, joined and created this New Blue party. But I noticed on television the other day the Ontario party of Derek Sloan's uh, is, uh, mm -hmm. they've got commercials out there now. And there's an Ontario First Party and a Libertarian Party that's been around for a while. And, you know, there's still a Trillium Party that's out there, which also is a right-wing party. There are a lot of right-wing alternatives in this province right now. And I wonder if you could sort of talk about what you think is driving the emergence of all of this. Yes, well, I think those splits are important to note, right, for political outcome purposes. Um, you know, uh, I said at the beginning that I don't think there's going to be much of a political outcome that's relevant, that's driven by the growth of the new blue. And partially that's because people on the right who don't, uh, who want an alternative to the Ford PCs, um, that that effort is kind of split amongst all these different small uh, parties. And they all seem to be sort of single or single issue or single message uh, parties that frankly, you know, uh, the other point I think is it's really hard to mount a political party and um, increase your name recognition and get into the media and get out in front of people. New Blue is doing the best job. Uh, they have the most candidates nominated. They have a sort of semi-coherent uh, policy platform. Um, the others are are sort of vanity projects, I think, for the for their leaders who are not doing a terribly good job of, of increasing their name recognition. And so that vote's splitting. Um, but I think part of why the, they're stuck on one or two issues, particularly COVID, which a lot of people are over now and don't want to think about anymore, is because, yes, but I just want to get back to this Ford uh, positioning uh, question. Yes, he's sort of center moderate on economic issues and material issues, where Sean's right, the left really has kind of uh, vacated and moved, moved further to the left and left him that room on the center. Um, but the other piece in terms of these union endorsements and these sort of um, the kinds of people that are the union members, because I think, by the way, the thing that's driving these union endorsements is their membership and the leadership's catching up to the membership, not the other way around. Um, uh, the leaders want to be where their members are. And the reason um, those members are with Ford, uh, for the most part, is because culturally he does have some pretty conservative touch points on crime. Um, on, uh, on, you know, uh, building on his brother's legacy of sort of uh, the, the, tax, uh, the tax piece of the fees piece that Martin was talking about around stopping the gravy trade and um, uh, uh, the, the Ontario public and, and the kinds of people who are members of these unions, they want to make sure their hospitals are built and highways are built and the problems is spending on the things that they want the problems to spend on. Um, but they also want a uh, government that's going to be tough on crime. They want a government that's going to, um, and a leader who kind of speaks to them and uses their language, which Ford is, Ford is very good on. So it's not as simple as, um, as this left-right spectrum. And that's, I think, why you see this fracturing of these parties on the right, because there's no one um, a theme or, or there's no broad grouping of policies they can seize on that, that Ford has vacated on the right because well, uh, it doesn't really exist. Let me suggest a theme here. Martin, let me get you to play with this one if you would. Belinda Carajalios was kicked out of the PC caucus. She started the new blue party. Uh, Rick Nichols was kicked out of the PC caucus for refusing to be vaccinated. He's now running for the Ontario party. Derek Sloan was kicked out of the federal conservative caucus. He's now um, the leader of the Ontario party. How much do you think revenge is behind the creation of all of these new right-wing parties? Well, connect the dots. It's funny that they didn't form these ideological cause or creed de coeur until they were kicked out and had nowhere else to go, had to, had to leave the sandbox and build one all themselves. So, yes, that's the motivation. Uh, revenge or, or a reprise, let's say. I think you forgot that Randy Hillier... Uh, who was flirting with setting up his own party as well until he got into so much trouble over COVID, anti-vax, convoys, anti-everything, that he kind of fell apart. So so absolutely, it is about, uh, it's personal, and, and it, is, uh, it is also anti-vax, and in that sense, it is anti-science. Uh, Jenny talked about how it was, it was partly 
uh, in later stages that people were wondering, well, why do we have these restrict restrictions? But remember, these parties formed when the science was most compelling. Science changes, by the way, as new evidence comes along. But when we didn't think that COVID could be transmitted, if we could, if we could get vaccinated uh, and that would stop transmission, that's when the vaccine passports were brought in until further notice, a new variant, Omicron, et cetera. So, uh, so that's part of it. But, you know, they, they created their own sandboxes. But guess what? Now New Blue can't play well with others. And as often happens in any uh, ideological, even religious, uh, atomization, fractures, different denominations. And so if you look at that New Blue's website, you'll see he's attacking the other parties personally. He goes after Randy Hillier for secret conspiracies. He goes after Derek Sloan for secret conspiracies. It's all over the map. They can't play well with others, and, and it's, except with his own wife and, and the wife with husband. I think it's important to remember it's called it's called the Education Quality and Accountability Office. So EQAO doesn't stand for the test. It stands for, supposedly, which we could quibble about, an arm's length office that has the capacity uh, to think about assessment, overall provincial assessment. So I would argue not throwing the baby out with the bathwater here, but definitely, as Kelly said, a rethink, definitely, as Tony said, um, looking at sampling. That's how PISA works. We believe that from all over the world. Um, we do sampling in Canada when we compare provinces. You don't need, it's just like uh, polls in an election. You don't, you know, every single person doesn't have to participate to understand where the sort of general success is. I think it's also important that we understand all the different sort of layers of assessment that happens. And we've been looking at what provinces and territories are doing across the country um, in terms of looking at the impact of the pandemic. And some provinces are doing a lot more interesting stuff or putting more into the mix when they're trying to understand um, the overall impact. They're looking at, you know, kids' report cards. They're looking at student surveys and, in some cases, and at standardized tests. But again, we've got this office. Let's repurpose it so that we have really great research about what's going on in our, in our system. And for me, especially in all of this, not just now, but into the future, uh, you know, because we've got to be able to hold both those things in our mind. Yes, recovery. What, what about renewal? What about going forward? Caroline, the clock has caught up with me here, and therefore I'm going to deprive you of the opportunity to comment on this. But I'm going to ask you to comment on what I think is the big overarching question of this campaign, which is the almost complete apparent lack of voter interest in education <laughs> issues as reflected in the public opinion surveys. We hear housing, we hear affordability. Uh, to a lesser extent, climate change. Education is not cracking the top three or four or five issues in this campaign, despite what the last two years have provided. Why do you think that is? That's such a great question, Steve, and I wish I had a good answer to that. Um, maybe everyone's just tired. That's what I can come up with. Um, we, if you remember before the pandemic, we had uh, teacher negotiations that led, led into work to rule and teacher strikes. Um, those contracts were only signed in March and April 2020, just as the pandemic was going, you know, was washing over Canadian shores here. So I think, you know, people have just gone through one set of upheaval after another in education. And, you know, coming out of this election, teacher contracts and education worker contracts are expiring at the end of August. So we're going to have another round of negotiations in front of us. So perhaps, you know, people are exhausted. That's all I have. Hmm. Uh, well, that's not bad, actually. Um, okay, Annie, what are your antennae I tell you about why this has just not been a big campaign issue at all? Well, beyond that it's really depressing that it isn't, I think that it tells us something, and maybe Caroline's right, we're all just tired of everything. I'm not sure how engaged people are in the election, in fact. But I think what it tells us is, and what we have to remember, is that education itself has kind of isolated itself from the world. So people who care about education have not, not done a good job connecting uh, education to all of those other issues, to jobs, like making that clear link between 
uh, be between jobs and education, between health and education. Education is the number one determinant of health, but we're not very good at making that clear. So I think it's a it should be a wake up call to all of us who care about public education to do more and better in terms of uh, you know a communication strategy, laying the groundwork to say that uh, you know public education is actually probably the foundation of all of these other issues of democracy, of citizen engagement, of, uh, you know, a thriving economy. But we definitely haven't done that right now. So it's really easy for everybody to see education as an issue for teachers and for parents. And why should I care? I don't have kids in school. Hmm. Did the deal between the feds and the province basically remove childcare as a political slash election issue because everybody thinks this is solved now. <laughs> yeah, well, I, th I think that is the case. I think that Ford's um, holdout, uh, you know, made our victory a little uh, less sweet. And I think that's exact <laughs> that was the intent, to hold out, to sign the agreement, and then move on and not have it be a topic of discussion um, because really there's no plan in place for how we're going to get there. So I do think that was the strategy there. Um, you know, check it off the list and move on and not have it be uh, a topic of discussion. It absolutely should be an election election issue. The uh, pandemic in the past two years have really um, served to magnify the importance of childcare and the need to build this Canada-wide system, but we really don't have any of the specifics and we need to be talking about it. And I really do hope Hope that when people are going to the polls, that um, even if they don't need childcare themselves, they know that their colleagues do in order to get to work, and it is a vital and critical service that we need to expand in a um, really mindful and thoughtful way. Adrian, what do you think? Why has this not been a bigger election issue? Yeah, I mean, I think it's very surprising that we've heard more about you know expanding. Or, or making available an optional grade 13 than we have about the biggest investment in early years learning ever. Um, and that's not to, you know, put aside the disruptions that students have experienced over the last two years, but we know from, you know, an educational uh, equality perspective, grade 13 only does so much. Where we see the huge investments in learning, where we see a quality of opportunity gains is when we invest in early years. And so it's really surprising to me that we haven't seen this politicized more, particularly because, you know, parents are still holding the bag on having to pay childcare fees. Most parents I know haven't seen any of the money uh, in terms of retroactive payments um, that were supposed to come before the election. Um, we saw the provincial government drag its heels on on negotiating, and that's had real sort of affordability concerns for parents even to today. So it's it is surprising to me that it hasn't come up more, um, given sort of both the fact that we have a lot to do on this file moving forward, mm -hmm. as well as the uncertainty that parents are still still experiencing. In fact, Carolyn Stephen Del Duca did an event in Oakville this morning at which he mm -hmm. explicitly pointed out that the Liberals would make those payments retroactive back to January. We mentioned that earlier in this uh, discussion. And that, uh, to the best of his knowledge, no parents had received those retroactive yeah. payments which the current government promised to do. So why hasn't child care been a bigger issue in this campaign? Yeah. Well, I think that, uh, you know, Athena, when you said that, uh, you know, the, the government signed just just at the deadline um, and that that kind of, you know, made it a non a non issue. That's exactly what we heard from um, all of the other parties, you know, when we reached out to them, you know, childcare is going to be there in our platform. But because there's not such a big contrast uh, between us and, and, you know, each of the other parties, it's not going to be a, a, a huge issue for us. But I think that, you know, even if it's not being discussed, it's certainly a big issue for parents. And that, as you, you said, Steve, the fact that no parents have actually received um, you know, lower fees at this point, um, I think that that is an issue because, of course, Doug Ford, when he signed that agreement at the end of March, he promised parents that they'd start to see lower childcare fees in May. And that hasn't happened. Right. May's um, over. I think it was an irresponsible promise to make. It was a promise made and a promise broken. So I think that that should stick to them. Um, the other thing I'd say really needs to stick to the Conservative Party is, um, you know, if we look back over the past four years, um, sure, they signed that agreement in March, but they were dragged to the negotiating table kicking and screaming. It was months. You know, we were the last province to sign on. And their record over the last four years on childcare has been, um, you know, pretty lacking in, in ambition.
Well, let the record show we have not ignored child care on this program, which is why we wanted to have the three of you on to discuss it. And, um, and Carolyn, if you can do it in 10 seconds, because you have the province-wide view on this thing, what grade, what letter grade do you want to give the PC government for the last four years on child care? Well, you know, I guess they would get, uh, you know, an incomplete on that last semester because they signed the agreement, but only, you know, just on the, the deadline. But if I'm looking over the past four years, it's a, it's a failing grade. John Snowblin, once upon a time, was the Minister of Education in the province of Ontario, and he looked something like this. Sheldon, if you would. I like to say that uh, in those days, not very long ago, when Betty Stevenson was the minister, our job in education was to prepare young people for the future. And now we have an additional burden as educators to prepare the future for our young people. And so uh, it's a different burden, really. So the first question is, don't we both look so much better today? No, that is not the first question. <laughs> The first question is, uh, what, what was this election about, anyway? Well, that's, uh, that's been the big question for 29 days. Uh, you know, I, I think that the political parties are oddly detached from where people are. I, I, I know, probably like my colleagues uh, tonight on this panel, that, you know, we've been going door to door. And the big issue for people is affordability. It's the dominant, it's kind of like, you know, when the alligators come in the pool, you quit thinking about swimming and everything else is on the side. And, and, and right now, you know, it's $2 a liter gasoline and the food prices, and that's the issue. And, and to the extent that political parties have spoken to it, they can connect to people. If they don't, they can't. Hmm. Once upon a time, Frances Lankin was a cabinet minister in Ontario, and she was a pundit on a previous program we did together on TVO. And that went something like this. Sheldon, again, if you would. What's happened in the last week has been really fascinating as uh, the Conservative campaign has gained popular ground, which it has. No one can deny that. In fact, it's not a horse race at this point in time. Uh, they're in the lead. Well, we talked about elections then. We're talking about elections now. What do you think this campaign's been about, Senator? Uh, well, I would agree with John in terms of uh, where people are at. Now, I, I don't go door to door uh, anymore. I'm an independent, so I don't uh, engage in partisan politics, but I am surely a keen watcher. I, I have found this election to be um, lackluster, uh, boring, frustrating, and uh, I, there's a lot of reasons. I mean, some of the issues are the issues that we've talked about in every election for I don't know how many decades. And I'm frustrated that we're not making progress. But the other thing I would say is that, you know, the issue of the economy, John's right, that's, you know, costs, uh, how we're going to get through this is on people's mind with all the weight of the post-pandemic um, anxiety and polarized politics. Uh, but it, that's not something that a province in and of itself can fix. So there's a mismatch between, um, you know, a buckle, uh, uh bus ride, sorry, <laughs> buck a bus ride. And, you know, the actual stuff that is um, is worrying people and what will fix it for people. So there are limited tools the province has, I get that. And I think that shows through in terms of the uh, commitments that the parties are making right now. Once upon a time, Greg Sorbera was the finance minister in the province of Ontario. Sheldon, if you would. This statement really says is that we've got a serious but manageable fiscal problem and that we're going to work our way out of it and we're going to ensure that we have the capacity to deliver on those improvements in public services. There you were talking politics 19 years ago and here we are again. Wow. What do you think this campaign was about? <laughs> well, I, I think it's simple, Steve. I think the question is, does the Doug Ford government deserve re-election? And I think, uh, to me, that's the ballot question. And uh, I think the answer is absolutely not. I mean, we have a crisis uh, in uh, uh, we have a crisis in our housing industry. We have a crisis in our healthcare system. We have a crisis in education. Uh, I remember in the last election, in the midst of the last election, Doug Ford said, "We are going to put an end to hallway medicine." Uh, three weeks ago, a dear friend of mine's mother was committed to hospital. And she spent the first four days in the hallway. What happened to that promise? Uh, and we have a crisis uh, with our seniors and caring for our seniors. And as the other said, we have a crisis in the cost of living. And when you add on the inflation that is now infecting the economy, 
uh, affordability becomes an even greater problem, and there's nothing uh, that the Ford government is promising to do anything about that. So uh, I'd say look at the record. It's not a good record. In fact, in almost every area of public service, it's an abysmal record, and that government does not deserve to be reelected. That's just some of what we've covered during the last week of the election. You can find more, including the full conversations, on our website, tvo.org, our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda, or our Twitter feed, twitter.com slash the agenda. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.